Fly, eat, repeat, fabulous Fly, folks. Eat, repeat. Welcome to the premiere episode of Fly, Eat, Repeat, the show where we defy gravity, dance in the skies, and soar above the clouds. Once upon a time, as old as man himself on earth, a person saw a bird flying. Since that day, your ancient human uncle, the dream of flying has not left his imagination. Your human grandfather used to see birds and dream of flying like them, however, it started and didn't come back. Sometimes you felt that human envied the birds in their moment of danger. They can fly to the sky and avoid this danger in a moment. While he must face this danger or run away from it. A long journey of danger and trauma bigger than Netflix. <laughs> So, once upon a time around 850 BC in Trinovantum, London, or Bath, there was a king named Bladded. Legend says that he was very skilled in magic and discovered the cure for leprosy. He conjures the spirits of the dead and the jinn who made wings for him and attached them to his arms, and he attempted to fly from the top of the Apollo temple. But it seemed that evil spirits were greedy for a new spirit. Bladded's flight turned into a nosedive, as the man fell and died. <laughs> So, his son takes power after his death, where's the drama? His son was King Lear, for whom Shakespeare wrote his famous and immortal play. The dramatic death of his father was the reason behind his madness when he reached old age. Abbas ibn Firnas was a polymath and early aviation pioneer born in 810 in El Andalus, which is present-day Spain. He is considered the first person to make a controlled flight in human history. Ibn Furnas is credited with inventing an early form of a hang glider with artificial wings. In 875, at the age of 65, he made the first attempt at controlled flight when he launched himself from the Mount of the Bride in the Rosafa area, near Cordoba. The flight was largely successful, lasting between 2 and 10 minutes, but the landing was difficult, resulting in an injury to his back. His achievements in aviation have inspired later scientists. In 1505, the rock star of the Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci. Millions of people every year flock to the Louvre Museum in Paris, France, to get a glimpse of his painting, the Mona Lisa. His depiction of Christ and his disciples, The Last Supper, even influenced the popular best-selling book by Dan Brown, The Da Vinci Code. He was a painter, sculptor, anatomy expert, engineer, and managing director of the Renaissance companies. Da Vinci predicted many inventions such as the steam engine, the tank, and the submarine. Da Vinci created designs for a machine called the ornithopter, a half-coat helicopter, it is an airplane with flapping wings that tries to imitate the shape of birds and insects found in nature, but it seemed like an incomplete project. Pierre de Forges, a French priest born in 1723, surrounded himself with a bit of controversy during his lifetime. In 1758, he was imprisoned in the Bastille for almost a year because he declared that Catholic priests and bishops should be allowed to marry. During his time in prison, de Forges found the time to study the mating habits of swallows which led to his future obsession with the mechanics of flight. In 1770, he attempted a flying experiment in Etamps, France, he constructed a pair of feather wings for this purpose. But he was afraid to try them himself, so he brought a farmer from his farm and told him, I want you on a mission that no one can do except you. I will tie your wings and cover you with feathers. The farmer loved knowledge, so he agreed and went with him to the church tower from above. But it seems that the farmer did not realize the dimensions of the issue, and he thought it was just a new outfit. So when Pierre said to him, come, let me explain to you how to fly. The farmer was afraid and refused. Here, my dear uncle Pierre understood that he needed more than just a feathered fashion show and more money to make a real aircraft. After two years of work, in 1772, he made the first flying machine. Six foot, 1.8 meter, long gondola covered by a canopy and attached with wings of nearly 20 feet, 6.1 meters, 
Pierre brought four other farmers to start his plane on top of Jeanette Tower overlooking the church. Of course, when they reach the tower, they are asked who will try first. The farmers were thinking about their friend who had wings and feathers. So, they said, your honor tries the first, of course. Pierre took the issue for his dignity. I am the one who will change the world. Go, farmers, on the ground, leave glory and flight to inventors like me. They did but they found Pierre planted in it with a broken leg. Dear, the dream of flying continued until the genius British engineer, the godfather of modern aviation, Sir George Cayley, came along. He said, guys, we are moving in the wrong direction, if we only think about fluttering, we will never fly. He created a model of gliders without engines, but they could be controlled. The last of them was the famous model that he made in 1852. It flew hundreds of yards before landing again. Did he bring a farmer to try? No farmers were harmed in the process, just an employee. Congratulations, you are hired for a new job. The job title is... The title is... <coughs> Coachman! Sir George's real achievement was in his way of thinking. For the first time, he tells us what are the forces that act on the plane during its flight, other than its weight, which is the lift force. We also have the force of forward momentum thrust, and finally the force of wind resistance drag. From here began the true science of aviation engineering in its form as we know it today. The Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur, developed an innovative mechanism for controlling an aircraft in flight, which involved twisting the rear outer tips of the wings in opposite directions using wires to warp the wood and fabric wings. On December 17, 1903, the Wright brothers made the first successful powered flight at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, with Orville at the controls. The Wright Flyer was the first successful powered aircraft built by the Wright brothers, featuring a lightweight, hand-operated engine, and a propeller driven by a chain. Fly, eat, repeat. Dears, fly eat repeat fabulous folks, there is a non-stop miracle happening above our heads every day, a piece of iron flying in the air. To understand the miracle, we need to understand a set of physics laws and their engineering applications. The first idea, my dear, is aerodynamics. The laws of air movement and the movement of objects within the air, in the case of an airplane, it depends on the external shape, the flow extent, and also the smoothness of the airplane during its flight until it reaches the most efficient way. To understand all of these, dear, we need to focus on airfoil. If you cut the wing of the plane, you will see it. It is what flies the plane. When the air passes over it, it produces a noticeable lifting force. Let me explain to you, my dear, because we consider this one of the most important human achievements. We're stealing energy from the fragile air, making it lift tons like it's lifting weights at the gym. <laughs> Genius, right? We're practically turning thin air into our dumbbell. Let's imagine a pair of air molecules walking side by side, entering the airfoil. What happens here is that one goes above and the other goes below. Physics says that the two will walk on the surface of the wing. As the upper surface is longer than the lower, the molecule of air that walked above must walk faster trying to reach the same time as its sister below. Although they do not connect, the speed of the molecule above is always faster than the speed of the molecule below. According to Bernoulli's law, as the molecule above moves faster, the pressure on the upper surface will remain lower than the pressure on the surface below which create the lifting energy. What a genius achievement! One asks, is this a fixed form? Of course no, there are many shapes and types. There is an airfoil for high speeds, which produces little lift and little resistance, another airfoil for low speeds and high lift, turbine blades for jet engines, and another for generating energy from the wind. My dear, you can find all types of airfoils in the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NACA, GUIDE, not NASA for space. Dear, now we understand how the air lifts the wing, but hold your excitement, we're not done. We want the plane to move forward and the air keeps carrying it. Here comes the second factor, push. The force that makes planes walk in the air. 
To make the air move on the wing, the plane must be moving forward. The idea is simply that you turn on the fan, suck the air in front of the plane, and throw it behind, creating a pressure difference, and voila! The plane moves forward. You ask me, my dear, what are the types of engines? Three main divisions of engines. First up, we have the propeller engine. An ordinary engine in front of an aircraft are located on the wings, like most World War II aircraft. These motors operate on the same theory as the car motors. Normal cylinders, internal combustion, and a reciprocating motion that turns into a circular motion. The problem with these engines, my dear, is that they are too heavy for the two or three hundred horsepower they produce. Then, we have the jet engine, the superstar of the aviation world, which was a breakthrough in the speeds that the plane could reach and the heights at which it could fly. I mean, imagine a jet engine can produce power up to 30,000 horsepower. While the previous propeller had just 300 horsepower. It's like going from a tricycle to a supersonic roller coaster. Jet engines rely mainly on a fan to extract air, which is very normal, but the jet engines take the air, compress it, and then burn it. Then it comes out after the fire at a very tremendous speed, entering a continuous turbine with the suction on the same axis. The turbine rotates quickly because of the exhaust, which exits quickly, so the suction fan rotates more, sucking more air. The air enters, compresses, burns, and comes out, rotating the turbine as it exits. It's like the engine is on a never-ending treadmill. As chicks grow, becoming bigger chickens that lay eggs which hatch chicks. And so on. Huge suction power and thus huge thrust force. <laughs> the first aircraft to fly with this type of engine was the German Heinkel HE-178 in 1939. Of course, after that, new, improved generations of jet propulsion appeared, such as the turbofan and turboprop, which is a jet engine with a fan mounted on it. <laughs> Lastly, we meet the third type of engine, my dear, the rocket propulsion engine, which depends on Newton's third law, that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. These engines give very high speeds, but for not long periods. For this reason, it is used in missiles and is rarely used in regular aircraft. But of course, since it was a less complicated idea, it was used before the jet engine. So before the Heinkel HE-178, there was the Heinkel HE-176. The first plane to use a rocket engine in history, the 176, flew only two months before the 178, it did not lead to great or bad results, but most importantly, it proved that the idea exists and can be implemented. The third step, as we've covered wings and engines, what's next on our plane building checklist? The chassis. How do you make a structure that achieves the desired streamlined aerodynamic shape from the outside and at the same time is strong, but even though it is rigid and solid, it is also light so that we can fly? It is common knowledge that when you design anything that is exposed to loads, you must provide it with an additional margin of safety on your own in anticipation of anything that might happen. You, for example, as an engineer, are required to design a building. This building is required to bear 100 tons. So, as a consulting engineer, you will design it to bear up to 500 or perhaps 1000 tons, and you say, I have a safety factor of 5 or 10. This means that the structure I design can bear 5 or 10 times as much as it is supposed to bear as a safety precaution. So, you are safe from winds and earthquakes. It's normal for additional sand, cement, and iron to be placed in the ground. But when it comes to flying, you do not have that luxury, because if you provide maximum safety factors and protection, oh my love, the weight of a plane like this will not fly, so you need to design a structure whose safety factor can remain 1.2 maximum. I mean, it is assumed that if the structure is supposed to lift 10 tons, you will make it load 12 tons. Of course, half of the travelers may worry. No, my dear, let me tell you this statement. Airplane. This piece of iron flying in the air is the safest means of travel in the world. This is safer than walking, my dear, and proven by numbers. Now, we have the chassis, covered with a streamlined aerodynamic exterior design, and installed the engine like this, so what's left? <coughs> Meals? Mm. Oh dear, we are hungry but let's not forget our mission. We want to fly the plane. And here, my dear, comes the last part, which is control and balance. For example, the car controls are the steering wheel, gas, and brake pedals. 
In the plane, you have gasoline and brakes. But the steering wheel in the plane, my dear, is a little complicated because the plane flies like a 3D roller coaster of madness. While the car is running in 2D. You can turn around in three different axes. Like dancing cha-cha through the clouds. For example, in a plane, you have something in the transverse tail. Elevator. By controlling, it helps you get the plane up or down under this first axis. The second is in the longitudinal tail of the plane. Rudder. The plane moves in the opposite direction, right or left, exactly like the rudder of a boat. The third is ailerons at the ends of the wings, and these are what control the rotation of the plane around itself by increasing the lift force on its wing and reducing it on the second wing, so the plane turns. Now we understand control. What is balance about? The issue of balance, my dear, is a matter related to two needs. The plane's external shape, its aerodynamic characteristics, and influence points on the one hand, versus, the plane's weight and center of gravity on the other hand. Civil aircraft, for example, will be designed so that if they are exposed to aerobic pitfalls or side winds, they will return to their normal condition without our intervention in terms of their design alone. Thus, without the pilot interfering, not even the autopilot, it always adjusts itself like a car after any turn, we call it a staple system. This type of system is similar to a ball that you place inside a large bowl. Every time the ball hits the right or left, it returns and centers itself around the bottom of the bowl until it's fixed. The fighter aircraft system, dear, is quite the opposite. The fighter plane does not adjust itself and does not return itself to any position, like a piece of cake, through its external appearance. My dear, in engineering, we call it the unstable system. The system is like a ball on the top of a mountain. If you push it in any direction, it will continue until the plane stops unbalanced. Why? This gives the warplane the required freedom to party in the sky, twist, turn, and maneuver. This makes the plane like messy. If you think we made a plane that flies and we won nature with a clean sheet, you're in for a surprise. Because the basic goal of aviation has branched out into a hundred goals. As soon as human succeeds in flying the first plane and we solve the problem of aviation in itself, a new and large set of problems opens up before us. The most important problem, my dear, is that I am hungry. Time for a snack break to wrap up this aviation roller coaster. Fly, eat, repeat. Fly, eat, repeat. Fly, eat, repeat. The first problem, my dear. The speed of the plane, the weight of its cargo, the distance it can fly, rates of climb and maximum flight altitudes. That would make Spider-Man jealous. Here man returns to obey mother nature, hug me, mom, and the birds in his eyes turn into models of airplanes, each one of them with a design because each one does something unique. You begin to notice the differences in the shapes and sizes of the wings, which one is for long distances, which one is for slow speeds, the tail and flutter shapes. What is special about an owl that flies almost without a flapping sound, while much weaker and smaller birds make a louder flapping sound? <coughs> Humans also notice the difference between the shape of the beaks of birds that fly at high speeds and those that fly normally, and also the wing pulling of some birds back as they descend quickly, catching a fish from the water, like a seagull. You see this design in warplanes so that they are fast and maneuver like a hawk pouncing on a rabbit. People also notice birds like ducks landing on the water. Nature's the OG aviation designer. And then there's the wild side of human imagination. Like the dragon, flying and creating fire, and centuries later he created an iron dragon, which is a military aircraft. The man imagined the legendary arrow, and centuries later he created ballistic missiles that could be intercontinental and travel half the globe to hit a target with an accuracy of one meter. Dear, human imagination is very strange, 
but it remains the most prominent thing that distinguishes him from the rest of the beings. A person could imagine a reality other than the one he lives in and make it real. For example, a person imagined if I knew how to speak to another person far away while sitting in my place, so he created a language, invented writing, made paper, made pens, and sent a message with anyone who takes a trip on foot or a horse, with enough food and drink to last him weeks or months, and he travels countries to deliver, later, to save cost, effort, and time. He exchanged him with a pigeon, faster and safer. This was the first version of WhatsApp. But he was not satisfied yet, so he invented the plane. He liked the idea of transmitting information quickly faster than a superhero costume change. On October 4, 1957, Sputnik 1 was successfully launched into space by the Soviet Union, as it was a carrier pigeon delivering a message from Earth to space. Dear, you are an amazing being. You're like magicians turning thoughts into reality. But strangely, a lazy person is not running to fly invented drones, so he can fly, photograph, fight, and operate everything while sitting on a lazy boy. On January 2, 2024, according to USA Today, Salah al arori who had a $5 million US information bounty on his head, was killed by a drone in Lebanon due to the ongoing Middle East conflicts. Fly eat repeat fabulous folks, laziness, and feelings of danger are what make the civilization you have. And hey, fly eat repeat fabulous fly, folks. Repeat. Watch the previous episodes, keep an eye out for the upcoming ones, check out the sources below, hit that subscribe button, and always remember this wisdom. Fear and laziness create civilization.